everyone. I think I'm live. Yes, I am live. Uh, fantastic. So hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me here today. My name is Matteo Liebowitz. I'm a research analyst at The Block. And uh, I'm going to share some thoughts on the open finance value proposition. So hopefully by the end of this, I've convinced everyone that the pursuit of growth in open finance is a legitimate and worthy cause. So we only have 20 minutes. Once I'm done with definitions, I'm going to walk through one case study and hopefully illustrate how it reflects some of open finance's core tenets. So let's start with definitions. Um, I think open finance broadly refers to financial services and products, things like lending, exchange, derivatives, asset management, payments, that satisfy the following two properties. So the first one being permissionless, the second transparent. And it's these two properties that distinguish open finance from legacy finance and naturally also form its core value proposition. So today we're gonna to be looking at these terms through the context of uh, MakerDAO, our case study. Um, for those that are unfamiliar, MakerDAO is the Ethereum-based credit facility that allows any user to lock up collateral and draw a synthetic US dollar pegged stablecoin DAI against the value of their assets. So that might be a lot to take in at once. Hopefully, over the course of this presentation, uh, I, will, I will shed some further light on, on how MakerDAO actually works. So let's, let's start with this term permissionless. Um, and really referring to this idea of unencumbered and non-discriminatory access. So I think when it comes to make a DAO, there are really two perspectives to consider here. First being protocol agents, so those that are interacting with uh, the, the service being offered, and then third-party developers, so developers who are building on top of the make a DAO protocol. So if, a, if an open finance product service is permissionless, means that anyone in the world with an internet connection and some ether can access it regardless of their geography, their age, their gender, their race, their political affiliation, etc. So who are these protocol agents? Well, in MakerDAO, we have uh, three core agents. Uh, it's a slightly simplistic view, but here we go. Um, so first off, we have the borrower, and they are seeking uh, to borrow USD denominated debt against the value of their crypto assets. Then we have savers, uh, so they are seeking uh, dollar denominated savings uh, and also uh, a low volatility store of value. And then finally, we have the governors and underwriters. So these are uh, the entities that set monetary policy and risk parameters and also serve as the lenders of last resort within the making our system. And in return, they receive um, uh, some portion of the interest that is generated by these borrowers. So how does permissionless access actually improve upon the existing experience for these agents? So let's start with the borrower. Um, really, we're talking about access to financial services for previously excluded demographics. So let's think globally, uh, as I'm sure you'll know now, there are about 1.7 billion unbanked uh, globally. If we think domestically, uh, in the United States itself, which is the largest economy in the world, there are 55 million people that are either unbanked or underbanked. So they are not being uh, served by the existing financial uh, system. Uh, when it comes to things like uh, opening a margin trading account, which is uh, kind of analogous to, to the product that Make It Now provides, you need a $2,000 minimum uh, to open one of these margin trading accounts. So that's pricing out uh, a significant portion of the population. And then uh, often you also face with accredited investor requirements. Uh, even just locally, if we think about, and, and locally being, uh, it's a loose term of the word locally, but if you think about um, the existing cryptocurrency market and market participants, uh, financial services are jurisdictionally con constrained and predominantly com concentrated in areas like North America and East Asia. So if you're uh, residing in Latin America or an African nation, then often you're not gonna have access to um, these types of cryptocurrency related financial services. The second uh, core, core benefit for, for borrowers is this idea of eliminating data related issues. This is really by design. So by foregoing know your customer processes, protocols 
simply cannot leak uh, sensitive financial related information. Uh, so on the bottom right here, you see a headline, Bitmax exposes customer email addresses. That's absolutely not going to happen uh, with one of these open finance uh, financial services. And, and you know there are various different examples here. Uh, Equifax uh, being a big one from last year where they leaked hundreds of millions of social security numbers. Now let's turn to the saver. So again, you kind of have the, the same uh, unbanked, underbanked implications uh, as we discussed with borrowers. Um, so this idea of access to savings account, uh, no minimum to open one of these accounts. And then you also have um, access to, uh, global access to uh, US dollar denominated savings. And that's uh, particularly significant in the context of hyperinflationary currencies. So uh, about two weeks ago, there were riots in the streets of Lebanon due to the inflation of the Lebanese pound versus the US dollar. And we've all had similar stories in Argentina, where the peso is down about 90% versus dollar over the past five years. And uh, similarly in uh, Venezuela uh, regarding their Bolivar currency. The second factor here is this idea of eliminating counterparty risk. Uh, so on the top right, there's this headline, Greek banks prepared to uh, plan, uh, plan to raid deposits. Um, so they introduce a 30% haircut on uh, customer deposits. Um, so uh, by the very nature of these protocols, you're not going to see things like um, withdrawal limits or um, uh, customer uh, deposit haircuts. Um, and naturally, you're also averting uh, scenarios like bank, run, bank runs, which we do uh, see even today. So uh, recent examples include uh, a Canadian bank as, as recently as 2017, obviously Greece in 2015, Bulgaria in 2014 as well. And then finally, we have this, this third set of agents, the governors and the underwriters. Um, so really here, it's, we're talking about an opportunity to build um, upside exposure to the fintech industry that has traditionally been reserved uh, to, to VCs. Um, so anyone can go out and, and purchase this MKR token and suddenly have upside exposure to uh, the MakerDAO credit facility. And an additional factor is this ability to influence monetary policy and risk parameters, um, which has previously been restricted to central bank governance. So now you can be part of that discussion. You can be in the in that room itself. So next, let's turn to uh, the the developer perspective when we think about permissionless. So how does open access improve upon the existing experience for developers? Uh, the first first thing to consider is this idea of seamless, unencumbered innovation. Really, you can think about smart contracts as open APIs. You can bootstrap services using existing infrastructure and liquidity. I think there are a few industries uh, that are growing at the pace of open finance. Um, each new protocol that launches spawns multiple derivative protocols, and that leads to this exponential growth. And here on the screen, uh, you'll see three examples that are all tethered to make it out itself, but um, crucially uh, offering differentiated products. And I think that speaks to the massive uh, potential of open infrastructure uh, when you think about innovation. So on the left here, we have DeFi Saver. It's an advanced loan management tool providing services like recursive leverage and automatic margin call protection. In the middle here, we have Chai, which is a wrapper for DAI, so that you can continuously earn savings rate without having to lock your assets in a particular contract. And then on the right here, we have a staked Ray. So this is a yield aggregator. It rebalances a portfolio of stable coins automatically according to the highest fixed income opportunities at any given time. I think staked is a, is a particularly interesting use case. Uh, Tarun Chitra, um, the, the CEO of Gauntlet Network, uh, often describes uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, but often describes this as the impressive and instantaneous gravitation of the open finance industry towards regulation national market system, REG NMS, which requires uh, regulated exchanges and brokers to provide their clients with best execution. So REG NMS was introduced in 2005 after decades of uh, securities market activity, and open finance has brought it to the market within a matter of months. So again, that kind of speaks to uh, the rate of innovation here. 
Second uh, factor cons to consider is this idea of eliminating platform risk. There are numerous examples of major tech giants like Twitter and Facebook revoking API access to third-party developers. Suddenly overnight, this foundational infrastructure has been cut off. And this really just creates additional risk to an inherently uncertain entrepreneurial process. Obviously not very conducive to innovation. Uh, so what MakerDAO uh, provides instead is guaranteed immutable infrastructure with 100% uptime. And that is uh, certainly a, a paradigm shift. So now let's turn to this second property, uh, transparency. And this refers to things like accountability, risk management, uh, decision-making. So what kind of beneficial insight are we afforded by MakerDAO's transparency? First is uh, superior risk management. So if we go back to the financial crisis of 2008, this was largely a result of opacity regarding the assets that were underlying these mortgage-backed securities, and also the extent of leverage within the financial system. So in, in 2007, the ratio of loans to deposits uh, hit 3.5 five to one in the United States. And that's double the ratio found in the second most highly leveraged banking system, Russia, and triple the ratios of the UK, Germany, and, and Japan. So there's this enormous amount of leverage within the US banking system. No one really had any idea. No one could, could audit this leverage. So if we turn to make a DAO, DAI solvency is guaranteed by, in theory at least, by the over-collateralized relationship between collateral assets and outstanding debt. And um, due to the transparent nature of the MakerDAO protocol, we can observe at any time, uh, we, can, we can audit and observe the collateral portfolio. So that's what we see on the left here, MakerDAO's collateral portfolio over time. You see it's still predominantly uh, made up of ether. And then on the, on the right side here, we have the system-wide collateralization ratio. So you can see that historically, uh, the collat ratio has hovered over 300%. So that means there are $3 worth of Ether backing each individual die. These two lines here, you have the, the, the turquoise one being the, the system mandated collateralization ratio of 150%. And then the, the red line is at 100%. So if, this, if the system wide collat ratio falls below that line, then suddenly die can be considered uh, insolvent. So again, anyone can monitor this in real time and ensure that that uh, the system is safe. As a die holder, you now know uh, both the extent of leverage within, this, within the system and uh, the asset composition of the collateral portfolio. Um, so the second uh, advantage that transparency provides is this idea of superior behavioral insight. As I, I like to turn to this quote from uh, Joseph Stiglitz, who says, I think we can have a better regulated economy if we had all the data in real time knowing what people are spending, it would enable the Federal Reserve to actually set interest rates in a much more efficient way. And I love this quote and I'm in absolute agreement here. So again, the, the transparent nature of MakerDAO um, provides us unencumbered insight into user behavior and that allows for superior decision-making uh, from protocol governance. So here, I'm just going to share some uh, data. Uh, this is quite simple here. On the left, we have DAI daily transaction volume over time. We see that, uh, well, this is really just over the past 60 days. We see that it's fallen, but still hovering around $50 million. And then similarly, DAI, uh, DAI daily transaction count has uh, come down over time. It's now hovering around 5,000 transactions per day. Obviously, you can get more sophisticated here. So uh, on the right, we have the average transfer volume per transaction, which we see is, uh, has been climbing over the past 60 days. Then on the left, we see uh, DAI daily velocity, which is um, uh, daily transaction volume over outstanding supply uh, versus DAI price. So uh, usually we see this uh, pretty clean inverse relationship between DAI price and DAI velocity. On March 12th, uh, we see this anomaly appear where velocity and price spike at the exact same time. And then since then, uh, this relationship has uh, reverted back into an, an inverse relationship. And we're seeing that as um, price comes down, velocity is also going up. And that's kind of the relationship we want to see. So again, make it our governors can, can 
uh, look at this data and, and make superior uh, decisions when it comes to things like monetary policy and risk management. And finally, you can get even more granular. So on the right here, we can actually look at the user uh, habits of, of die holders. This is the top 20 addresses by transaction volume inflow. Uh, as you might expect, a lot of it has to do with uh, speculative uh, use cases, uh, things like exchanges, Oasis, Kyber, um, lending protocols like Compound and Fulcrum. Uh, Uniswap is also on there. And then on the left, we, we can uh, see the number of addresses per die balance range. So you see over 30,000 addresses with between zero and one die, uh, fewer than 5,000 addresses with uh, between one and two die, uh, and then all the way into the millions. I think there are around four addresses that have somewhere between 2.5 and, and 4.5 million die. You can kind of use this data and back into a Gini coefficient and again, have a better sense as to um, the economic status of participants within this die based economy. So the third, third, I think the third, the third factor I'd like to consider is this idea of uh, superior accountability. Um, so you have this transparent political process, both in the soft social co contract like commitment to open discussion that make it out uh, governors and, and shareholders uh, uh, align with. And then you also have this hard commitment to execute on um, transparent and, and immutable blockchains. So on the left side here, you see the, the cumulative MKR sold off in the post Black Thursday debt auction. So as mentioned earlier, uh, the underwriters of MakerDAO, these MKR holders bear responsibility uh, in the event of defaults. And you have this programmatic guarantee to recapitalize the system. So again, anybody can uh, look at the Ethereum blockchain and see that MKR is being auctioned off over time and that the system is re-entering into uh, a sufficiently capitalized state. On the right side here, you have these two tables. Um, the, on the left, you see uh, transactions committing executive vote decisions to make his governance contract. Uh, so rather than enshrining changes into law, you see ch changes actually enshrined into code itself. And, and again, that uh, adds uh, particular guarantees. In the event of malicious behavior, as you can see on the right, you have these time-locked uh, protocol changes. So anyone can observe these time-locked changes and exit uh, before they are affected. And, and this is really important when it comes to protecting system users. So it kind of gives everybody the, the, the benefit of, of hindsight before uh, events have actually taken place. And then finally here, um, we have uh, so, some more data around MKR voter activity. Uh, so anyone can analyze how particular MKR holders are, are, are voting and the frequency at which they are voting as well. And this is kind of this data-driven way of evaluating commitment uh, and sensibility to the protocol's core values. Um, this is definitely important when it comes to things like delegation and, and representation uh, within the system. And, and it's certainly, uh, a, a stepwise improvement from uh, the way that we traditionally um, uh, allocate our influence to uh, social representatives. So just to wrap up here, I don't know whether I'm uh, ahead of time or not, I think uh, slightly so, but just to wrap up, uh, Make It Out is just one of dozens of projects that or under this open finance umbrella. You have the same permissionless and transparent properties packaged into various different use cases, all of which have the potential to make significant strides uh, when it comes to things like financial innovation, economic inclusion, social mobility, risk management, and accountability. So on the right side here, um, we have the blocks open finance index. Uh, this is an, an attempt to measure the aggregate economic activity across various non-standard financial services. You can see that the OFI is up about 50% year to date and 130% over the past 12 months. So it's staying very uh, promising and, and, and steady uh, growth within this industry. And I am very, very excited to see where we end up 
in 12 months time. That's it for today. And thank you so much for having me.